Part 1. You will hear a woman discussing phone services with a salesman. You have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Good morning. May I help you, ma'am? I'm reading one of your brochures on wireless services since I'd like to get the internet at home. I wonder if you could tell me about some different deals. Certainly. First of all, do you have any packages that are wireless and mobile phone combined? I'm afraid we don't. That's a pity. You may like to know that from next week we're starting a deal whereby... Anyone who signs a phone contract for 18 months gets a brand new smartphone. That way, the internet is with you all the time on your phone and not just at home on your computer. How does that sound? I'm sure lots of people will jump at it, but I don't want the internet with me all the time. I don't need a fancy phone. I need to be contactable for work. I'm a post-grad student and I support myself with relief teaching. I need to send a few texts and make a couple of calls a day, but that's all. A basic phone and prepaid monthly vouchers suit me. As you please. Also, my friend bought a smartphone recently, dropped it and shattered the glass screen. To get the screen replaced, she's going to spend $300. Well, $300 is almost my annual phone budget. Yes, you do have to be careful with smartphones. However, for just a few dollars a week, we also offer insurance against damage or theft. That might be worth considering. Thank you for the offer, but I'm sticking to my cheap phone that I've dropped a dozen times but still keeps working. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. Let's get back to wireless services at home. I've brought my laptop and I'd like to see if your modems are compatible. We've got a comprehensive range of modems, so I'm sure we'll find something. What operating system do you have? OS X 12.5. I'll just check that. Sorry, it's OS X 12.9. Yes, several of our modems will work with that. If I choose a deal now, is there any chance I can get my computer set up right away? Absolutely. You can be online in 15 minutes. Really? I know I said I didn't want a long-term plan for my phone, but for wireless, your 24-month plan looks the best. I think it's excellent, Mom. $80 a month for 10 gigabytes and a modem. If I opt for this contract, what would you need from me now other than the cash? Proof of identification, financial details and an official letter with your address. Pardon me? Proof of ID, a bank statement and a letter like a gas bill or a payslip sent to where you live. I'll see what I've got in my purse. Here's my student card. I do online banking now, so no statements. Here's an electricity bill I paid yesterday. I'm sorry to say, ma'am, but those things aren't enough. You can't sign a long contract without showing your passport or driver's license and something from your bank. Have you thought about the prepaid one-month internet deal similar to the one you already have for your phone? 
According to your brochure, it's a lot dearer. About 50% dearer than the two-year contract. Yes. Prepaid is always more expensive, but it has fewer obligations. What do you mean? Well, on the 24-month plan, there's also a $200 cancellation fee if you end the service by leaving the country permanently. Goodness, I had no idea such things existed. I'm afraid so. How about one-year contracts? I couldn't see any one-year contracts advertised. Do you have them? They've just been discontinued. There wasn't enough demand. But a six-month prepaid is possible. Do I need lots of ID for that? No. What about the modem? Is it still included? With prepaid, customers supply their own modems. I do, however, have one here for only $110. $110? I think I'll need some time to think things over. Not a problem. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man being interviewed about running a small business. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Let's welcome John Lim, owner of Small Business Training, to today's show. Nice to join you. First of all, I've heard you've got triplets, John, as well as a growing business. That's right. Two boys and a girl. They're six years old. I tell people running a business is like looking after children. Apart from being flexible and expecting the unexpected, you need clear priorities and excellent time management. In a way, I owe my business success to my children. Like so many young families who struggle with the high cost of living, we couldn't afford to stay in the city any longer, so we moved to Casterbridge, which, at the time, met all our requirements. It was really flourishing, particularly because its cleaner industries, like light engineering and servicing, were replacing agriculture and mining so it seemed a desirable place for people to set up small businesses. What's it like now? Unfortunately, the last three years have been pretty tough due to the downturn in the economy. A third of the new companies in Casterbridge have gone bust. Still, the national figure for the failure of small businesses within two years of establishment is around 40%. So maybe a third isn't too bad. 40%? Why so high? Let's consider success for a moment. To be successful in a small business, you need to know your customers. Who's going to want your product? You need to lower expenses, not by putting off staff, but rather by cutting out unnecessary luxuries. And most importantly, you need to tailor your product to a niche market. In the case of my company, I had a good product, training. Initially, we provided basic accounting training for non-accountants. Later, we provided business management skills seminars. For a company to stay alive, it needs a good product, followed by another good product. You diversified, right? Yes, I did. After providing overall management skills techniques, I moved into the more specialised area of time management. I gave workshops on how to manage time to businesses in Casterbridge and surrounding areas. 
You see, even if a company has capital, the money to get it up and running, many business people don't manage their time well or plan well. Time management is easy if you stick to the rules, which are schedule large and small tasks, keep to your time limits, keep focused, learn to delegate, set goals and learn to rest. That 40% failure rate I mentioned earlier is mostly the result of poor planning. I see. To be successful, you've got to operate on two levels. First, you need a five-year plan, where your business is headed and what its core activities are. And second, you need a day-by-day -day plan, a list of daily tasks in order of importance. Before you listen to the rest of the interview, you have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. When I spoke to you before the show, you said you were branching out once again. That's right. I've recently sold the management and training parts of my business, and now I'm into research and counselling. In fact, I've just completed a major survey on working from home for the government. Working from home is my dream. Really? Wait till you hear the statistics. Six out of ten respondents to our survey said their efficiency was lower at home than in an office. Five out of ten people we surveyed worked many more hours each week than they would in a conventional office. It's all too easy to check your emails after dinner rather than scheduling them into acceptable working hours. And four out of ten people in our survey suffered from loneliness. Loneliness? Perhaps they miss the office gossip or haven't got a pet to talk to. Seriously, though, many of us need to socialise because, on the whole, humans are gregarious creatures. Tell me about your counselling work. I'm helping people who've gone bankrupt. As you probably know, this is a dreadful experience, both financially and emotionally. It's one time when you really do need a good accountant so you can come out with something. Indeed. Also, here's a tip. It may sound odd, but if your business does go bankrupt, take a holiday. Have a week in Bali. Or if you can't afford that, head off to a lake, a beach or a national park. And then shrug your shoulders and go on. Life goes on. Yes, it does. Many thanks for your insights, John. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two university students discussing their essays. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 26. How's it going, Sue? Pretty well, except that I'm almost asleep on my feet. I was up until 2 a.m. finishing my essay. Me too. However, I've still only written 1,800 words, and we're meant to hand in 2,500. 
I've no idea where I'm going to get another 700 from. Oh dear, I've got the opposite problem. My essay is nearly 4,000 words long, so I'll need to be quite brutal with editing. However did you manage that? I'm really interested in the topic, so I did lots of independent research. I've got a pretty thorough knowledge of the HDI now. The HDI? The Human Development Index. You know, the list of indicators for health, income, sustainability. Yeah, yeah. What statistics did you draw on for your discussion of poverty? Don't ask. The graphs and charts I found I didn't know how to describe. So in the end, I cut and pasted a table and a paragraph from my friend, Abdul's essay. He took this course last year. I don't really understand any of the stuff I copied from him either, but he passed, which is all that counts. I see. Before we meet our tutor, Sue, I wonder if you could do me a favor. When I had my consultation with him last week, he crossed out so much of my first draft that I had to start all over again. OK, show me your first page. Well, you might add a sentence to your introduction. It's not clear to me which argument you support, or is that in the conclusion? But if I add one sentence to the introduction, that's only another 20 words. True. Skimming through this, it seems you've used two sources for research, whereas our lecturer insisted that we have at least five. This quote on the second page is really long. It is relevant, but I hope you realise quotes aren't counted in the word limit. So now, I don't even have 1,800 words. How about I take away the quotation marks so it'll look like my own writing? I don't think that'll work. In fact, it's plagiarism, stealing from another writer. Our essays are put through a computer programme to check what's copied from elsewhere. I don't get why people care about plagiarism. In my country, that's how we learn. At secondary school here, some students do copy, but at university, we should develop our own ideas. What if I don't have any ideas? Then it's time to get some. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation... You have 30 seconds to read questions 27 to 30. What shall I do about this long quote, Sue? You can paraphrase or summarise it. You'll need a reference as well. A reference? An in-text citation, like the Harvard system. You need to acknowledge where the information came from. Whoa! We were given a worksheet on the Harvard system in the first tutorial. Have a look at my essay now to see what you need to do. Are these names and dates in brackets a reference? Yes, they refer to the bibliography on my last page. That reminds me, you don't seem to have attached your bibliography. Do you have it floating around in your bag? Yes, here it is. Have a look. Is this your bibliography or Abdul's? What do you mean? Well, I'd say it was Abdul's, because there are seven sources and none of them is either on our reading list or referred to in your essay. Our tutor wasn't born yesterday. I can sort the bibliography out later. That's the least of my worries. We still haven't solved how I'm going to write another 700 words in fewer than 24 hours. You'll need to do some more research today. I found Newcomb really helpful and also Sword. Why don't you read them? I would if I had time, but I'm working tonight. In fact, I start at 2 o'clock and go through till 9.30. Read the articles at work, then. They're not very long. 
I found both of them offered convincing arguments for redefining poverty, and their alternative indicators for failed states are also interesting. But I'm running out of time, and I can't walk around the menswear department reading scraps of paper. Look, let me make a suggestion. Why don't you write the extra paragraphs, Sue? I bet you'd be able to do them in about a half an hour. You could email them to me tonight. I'll check my email the minute I get home. In return, I'll give you a gift voucher from my department store. Nice try. Firstly, I've got to work tonight as well. Remember I told you about editing my essay? Secondly, the tutor will spot my writing style. And lastly, believe it or not, I'm that rare breed of female who doesn't like shopping. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture on desalination. Before you listen, read questions 31 to 40. In an era of climate change, many countries no longer have the rainfall they used to have. Furthermore, with population increase, the already depleted groundwater supplies are running out. Therefore, worldwide governments, cities, industries and ocean-going ships have opted for desalination. There are various methods of desalination used in the world today. There's solar desalination, geothermal desalination, multi-stage distillation, and saltwater reverse osmosis desalination. In this lecture, I shall describe saltwater reverse osmosis desalination, with particular reference to the supply of fresh drinking water. I shall also outline its drawbacks. Desalination is the process of removing salt and other minerals from water molecules, making it potable or ready for drinking. In reverse osmosis desalination, seawater is purified by being forced at very high pressure through a membrane, a kind of skin. The solid waste and bilge are separated out and the water sent on to the consumer. There are seven stages to the process. Follow me on the diagram while I explain. Corner, you can see the word intake, which means filling a pipe in the ocean. This water goes to the pumping station. Here come two objections to desalination. There are lots of pipes causing leakage or evaporation, so we lose the very water we're trying to catch. Secondly, pumping requires energy, massive amounts of energy, which produces greenhouse gases. Back to the diagram. At the pumping station, the water is screened. Sand, shells and rubbish are removed. Next, the water is forced into a revolving cylinder. Inside this cylinder, there's mesh and a sandwich of membranes through which the impurities are spun out. The concentrate, brackish, salty waste, is pumped back into the sea. That's number 34 on your diagram. After desalination, fluoride is added. Then, the water goes into a huge clear water storage tank 
before entering the city's existent water network. Desalination produces fresh water, but at what cost? The organization Food and Water Watch found desalinated water to be the most expensive form of fresh water available, costing five times as much to harvest as other sources. The price tag on one plant in Sydney was more than two billion Australian dollars. Another objection is that cheaper alternatives exist. Take recycling. Currently in Sydney, about 2% of the total amount of water used is recycled. However, if rainwater were captured in tanks on the roofs of buildings, then it'd be easy to recycle up to 20% a year. Roughly the amount of fresh water a desalination plant produces in the same time. Recently, there's been a campaign to educate Australians about water use. They've also been restrictions in place, like when you can water your garden or fill your swimming pool. With just these two things, education and restriction, Sydney residents use 10% less water in the past five years than in the five preceding. As I've said, Desalination plants require excessive energy, but there's another problem. They flood the ocean with waste. In Sydney, up to 1.5 billion litres of concentrate go into the Pacific Ocean daily. And perhaps even more alarmingly, there's a problem at the intake end too. Marine biologist Sylvia Earle has commented on the hidden environmental cost of desalination by claiming that ocean water is filled with living creatures, and most of them are lost in the process of desalination. You might be asking, why were desalination plants built in the first place? Probably because water could be even scarcer in the future, and it's easier to build big projects than to persuade millions of homeowners to recycle. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.